still in Oh, er no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So we can chat. Hi, you guys. Hi. <laughs> no, I like to hear that. Did you know she stayed behind to take your course? That's how much she likes you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's flattering. All right. So in History 102, um, I hope you guys did okay on your tests. Uh, if not, remember, it's just one 50-point assignment out of 16. All right. And so um, today we are doing the New Deal with FDR, with Franklin Ro Delano Roosevelt. And let's see here. Let me get the names down. And so uh, I particularly am just enamored with this uh, this. Uh, topic. I'm not necessarily a court history guy where I, uh, you know, tend to uh, eulogize and make a, a, a saintly figure out of FDR particularly, but I think it's just anything but a boring subject. Uh, a lot of the novelty that happens during the 1930s under his administration. As you may know, another uh, uh, interesting factor is he's the only president to have been elected four times. Uh, he's gonna contend, right, oftentimes that he is, he likens the circumstances of the Great Depression uh, to um, wartime contingency, uh, as if we're in a war against poverty in the Depression, and he is going to um, claim for himself almost wartime powers as the um, chief executive, and so he's going to take steps. He's going to be granted uh, latitude in, in what he does as the president and directs and delegates that um, in many ways, excuse me, were, were unprecedented uh, amongst uh, presidents in the past, especially um, when you find that the only uh, kind of comparable cases where presidents made such large steps into the economy, et cetera, only were during uh, wartime uh, periods where, you know, the Constitution itself, uh, uh, suspending habeas corpus and, and other uh, parts of the Constitution kind of hint that those are exceptional times where the president can become a little larger in his involvement than under usual peacetime, um, you know, uh, eras. And so this technically is peacetime until 1941 with Pearl Harbor, and we get involved finally in World War II, and he does a lot um, as a peaceful, a peacetime president. So let's see here, one, two, three, four. All right, so I have all your names, that's great. All right, and so um, what I wanna do is I wanna share again uh, the page. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt, right? Um, so notice, right, uh, when he becomes president, there are uh, many themes that are attached to his presidency uh, to this day uh, that, that can be seen as somewhat, you know, uh, traditions or legacies in which things aren't going to be quite the same after his presidency. So he's elected in 32. Um, he's continually elected until he dies in 45. So he's the president for 13 years. Uh, they're going to make an amendment, obviously, subsequent to, hit, to this, that's going to limit the presidency to two terms, uh, but he's going to claim exceptional circumstances and fighting um, the Great Depression as well as World War II. Um, also, he's going to be largely responsible for an enlarged coalition under the Democratic Party. You guys have probably have heard the term uh, umbrella uh, party. Uh, whereby they are going to, uh, the Democrats are going to try to capture very divergent demographics or factions, right, uh, under their common banner. Uh, so, for instance, um, as a uh, somewhat progressive, being brought up and educated with progressive education, being somewhat of a progressive uh, governor of New York, uh, he is going to um, gain hold of the, of the progressive faction. Because remember, the progressives, like you look at like fighting Bob La Follette of Wisconsin, uh, Hiram Johnson of California, 
they were technically Republicans. Teddy Roosevelt claimed to be a progressive president and he was of the Republican party. There were attempts by Roosevelt, Teddy, uh, his fifth cousin, uh, to try to implement a third party, a progressive party, and it didn't last. And so he is going to um, really uh, pull a lot of progressives from the Republican party into his Democratic party. So that's one faction. Um, his uh, Wagner Act and the uh, National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, particularly Section 7A that we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, that's going to win over the unions. So a lot of urban, northeastern, big union guys, right? Like the, uh, the Congress of uh, uh, the CIO uh, it was a huge uh, labor union. Uh, and other uh, union leaders uh, like um, uh, John L. Stevens and others, they're going to uh, flock to the Democratic Party and be won over uh, by this new deal. So with that, a lot of industrial manufacturing uh, era uh, laborers, factory workers and union members are gonna flock to the Democratic Party. Uh, he also is gonna win over a lot of farmers. Uh, he's gonna take some, area, some elements to the old populist party. Remember the populist felt like there was a plutocracy going on that the, the government, especially the federal government, uh, was uh, lopsidedly in favor of big businesses. Uh, the hated middlemen like the railroads and others that were charging, um, giving great uh, discounts and rebates to the Rockefellers and the big guys, and then sticking it to the small guys. Um, the conservatives wanted to keep the, mo the money supply small and a lot of farmers were indebted and keeping the money supply small uh, hurt debtors and helped creditors to get the full value of their money back, but made it more difficult for debtors to pay those debts back. And so a lot of like populist uh, people in the Midwest and South that were for the, um, the plight of the common farmer, uh, the small cash crop farmer, the sharecroppers and tenant croppers are going to um, oftentimes go toward the Democratic Party at this time uh, for Franklin Roosevelt. And then also, I don't want to I don't want to overstate this, okay? Because it, it's very limited in its um, in his success. But he also is largely attributed to he and especially his wife, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, are going to be um, oftentimes historically tied to the transition of African Americans uh, moving from the party of Abraham Lincoln, the Republican Party that had freed slavery and helped out African-Americans in the South during Reconstruction at the end of the Civil War. Uh, a lot of them are gonna now change to the Democratic Party because of the New Deal and the limited ways in which the New Deal helped um, African-Americans. And his administration made some uh, gestures, if you will, uh, in helping out the plight of African-Americans. I don't wanna overstate that because not only because of the facts and how much the New Deal helped uh, African-Americans, but also I don't want to overstate it because FDR has quotes um, contending that he had good intentions in helping out African-Americans, but felt like he had his hands tied behind his back because there were so many Southern Democrats in Congress uh, in, in, in both branches of the, the House of Commons and the Senate uh, whom he needed to pass, help pass his New Deal legislation and a lot of them as white Southern Democrats were from the old democratic tradition of being racist and, and being um, supportive of um, the Jim Crow laws in the South. So that's, that's kind of limited, but nevertheless, they contend that that legacy was brought forth too. But also, right, the legacy of liberalism changing, okay? Uh, prior to um, this administration, arguably, liberalism was still in line with uh, the liberalism of the 1800s, which is known oftentimes as classical liberalism. And that you could, if you wanted to look into classical liberalism, you could look into the writings of John Stuart Mill, okay, as kind of a spokesman for that movement, that ideology. And classical liberalism was much more libertarian. Remember government, don't tread on me, keep government as small and unobtrusive into our lives and to uh, maximize the individual's uh, freedom and autonomy from government intervention. So classical liberalism was a bit uh, laissez-faire. Remember laissez-faire, uh, like from the writings of Adam Smith and the Enlightenment, 
um, government, keep your paws out of the economy. Uh, let the invisible hand of the market do its thing. Let people be free and private enterprise be as free as possible. Uh, liberalism will change uh, largely due to this new deal and it especially will change uh, a little bit ahead of time with Lyndon B. Johnson's administration in the 60s, whereby their notions of, of, of government and their notions of freedom are going to um, change a little bit. And that is, is it's gonna start kind of a paradigm shift where the government is gonna contend that it is the government's role to ensure a more equal allocation of the fruits of labor in this country. That when everyone's working, uh, including of course the, the common sharecropping farmer, uh, the common uh, manual labor in a factory, that they, the government should ensure that they have a basic uh, living wage, that they should be free from the anxiety of, um, th they use the term oftentimes security, that, that, the, that the common person ought to be guaranteed by the government uh, economic security, not worrying about when the next meal is gonna come and, and that they could have a fair uh, share of the fruits of all the labor that was going on in the country. And so hence, uh, big business and the robber barons uh, not monopolizing the fruits of that labor, right? So there you see the progressive part of modern liberalism, right? When we went over the progressive movement. And um, he also is going to, um, uh, as part of this paradigm shift in liberalism, he's going to down, um, uh, he, he's, he's going to not emphasize nearly as much the idea of competition, right? And he's going to use the term oftentimes cooperation, uh, not only cooperation between the government and free enterprise and, and private sector of businessmen and businesses and laborers, but also the cooperation amongst those uh, in the same industry uh, to ensure that the basic person had a, uh, a common standard of living. And then of course, um, you, you can't forget the legacy, right? Of uh, Keynesian economics, right? Named after John Maynard Keynes, an economist at this time, whereby uh, the assumption is, is a uh, member going from the Republican administrations under Secretary of Treasury, Andrew Mellon, uh, later on in derogatory fashion, it would be likened during Reagan's time by his opponents as trickle down economics. And the idea, right, that you don't tax, especially punitively tax and punish the success of big businesses. And um, by not, not taking too much income tax and other tax revenue from big business, that with that added money that they could hold on to, that they will use that extra money in ways that trickle down to the common person. So hence that they will, uh, with more money in their uh, coffers now, less of it going to Uncle Sam, that they will uh, open new factories, uh, hire more workers, buy more machinery, and invest that money in ways, again, that end up trickling down and giving jobs, uh, not to mention that extra money, they could streamline production and make production faster and cheaper so they could afford to put their wages or their prices down so their laborers and other laborers can better afford to buy the products that they're making, et cetera, et cetera, right? He's going to change that paradigm in light of the spirit of John Maynard Keynes, and he's going to say, no, the health of the economy is largely based on the purchasing power of the average American laborer, the average American farmer, and, and, and an American for that matter, right? He called uh, uh, them the forgotten man, the common man who's just uh, striving to make ends meet, that the government ought to bear responsibility for helping to ensure through regulation and through cooperation of, of in the economy to ensure that the common person has money in his or her pocket that he or she can go to the stores and patronize the businesses and spend their money and get everything going. So it had a philosophical side, right? Where it sided with the underdogs, those at the bottom and, and with their sense of fairness, right? Uh, but also it had a practical dimension to it where they felt like that better ensures the health of the economy. Because after all, during the depression, right? A common, the, one of the most salient problems that were existing 
during the depression is big business was creating way too many goods and products that were not being bought and sold uh, because the average Americans did not no longer had the purchasing power to buy it. So what good is it to make all those products if the common person can't buy them? All right. Uh, any questions so far on that as far as, you know, um, argumentatively, uh, the legacies that FDR left as a president? I don't, okay. have, I don't have a question, but I'd like to know what habeas corpus means. Uh. Oh, with habeas corpus, it literally <laughs> means to have a body. So like in time of war, uh, the Constitution states that a, a government like uh, Abraham Lincoln did can suspend habeas corpus uh, without having you uh, gain your constitutional access to a speedy trial and, uh, and, and, and represent yourself in court, have your own attorney uh, counter examine your hostile witnesses that are indicting you, uh, that you could be held indefinitely uh, during the war or during a time of emergency or rebellion and the, the, uh, the government can, can charge or in indict you uh, of a crime without you even being present, much less having access to a speedy trial, an attorney being able to counter your hostile witnesses and so forth. I see, thank you. No problem. All right, and so what are some of the interpretations? That's a good question. Um, to uh, the, the, great, the Great Depression's answer uh, in the form of FDR's administration known uh, generically as a New Deal. And that was his own term he used when he ran for president in 1932. So for one, right, uh, court history contends that he was a courageous, idealistic, radical ideologue, all right? So remember, idealistic, you don't see the world as it is, but you see it as it ought to be. You want to improve it. An ideologue is someone who adheres to certain um, principles and in some ways, it's oftentimes hinted, not always, but that those principles are a little bit almost utopian, right? Like, like, like different Marxists, uh, socialist, communist, syndicalist, and those who want to create a, a, a much better world, right? And you want to faithfully adhere to those principles in remaking society uh, for the better in your mind, right? And so some people convey FDR uh, in that fashion. I put H.W. Brands, his book called Traitor to His Class, is a fascinating book because I feel like it's a good, uh, a healthy balance. Uh, it shows FDR is a little bit in, at times as a, a demagogue, a little bit at times as a typical political pragmatist. We'll get into that. But also, ultimately, I think especially when you look at chapter 26 of that book, he makes the assertion that he was at least limitedly a courageous, idealistic um, radical who wanted to radically change uh, the government's uh, intervention in the economy, okay? So for one, we talked about it, uh, Keynesian economics. Uh, the idea of, you know, because it, it, it was an axiom that you didn't question in po American political tradition up to this point, arguably, that you have to maintain a good, healthy budget uh, as if you were a, a business, a private business, right? You can't spend more than you bring in, that that will have harmful effects on the economy. You don't wanna spend the government into debt, um, but be responsible with government spending. Uh, at first, he adheres to that. Uh, he tries to call for balancing the budget. He tries to cut spending uh, the first days he comes in. But by the end of his second New Deal in the mid to late 30s, uh, that's going to largely change. And he's not going to be afraid of spending um, into debt, uh, spending money that the government did not have uh, through a combination of literally inflation, uh, printing more money, new money, uh, and, and able to do that, taking us off the gold standard, because that was a part of economic um, uh, responsibility is that we only printed and only allowed enough money in circulation uh, that was backed by gold, the government's um, you know, uh, possession of gold reserves. And so normally, however, right, that tended to hurt those who were in debt, right, and owed money. And it tended to help those who had money owed to them. So it kind of became during the populist movement, for instance, 
a rich versus poor man's issue. The rich wanted to keep money limited in the amount of circulation, right? And, and, and held to how much gold we had. And then the populace saying, no, we need to get off the gold standard, at least to the silver standard that we had more of uh, to help poor debtors um, more easily pay back their debts and devalue the amount of the American dollar to make it easier to, to pay back. So he's gonna side in the populist direction, right? For the poor. And he's gonna agree with um, uh, simply printing more money and borrowing more money, uh, get, getting us in the short run further into debt. But what some people refer to as priming the pump, that his idea was, okay, in the short run, I get it. Uh, this is gonna cause inflation by printing more money. It's gonna cause uh, uh, a further higher debt and, and borrowing more money. But in doing so, uh, it's going to help uh, um, save the banking industry and it's gonna help provide wages to the American common person and give them purchasing power to get America back on its feet. And then we'll worry about the debt later. So that was seen to be kind of radical. OK, um, also his informal cabinet, when you look at Henry Wallace, um, uh, a guy named Harold Ikes uh, and, and uh, um, Hugh Johnson and others, maybe not Hugh Johnson, uh, but you look at his official cabinet, they didn't tend to have a very uh, radical background as far as their education, as far as what they had written and spoke, as far as their beliefs. Matter of fact, many of them had business um uh backgrounds and so hence that was more in line with the republican party of the 20s right to run the government like a business so what better way to do that than to have x businessmen uh run uh the different departments however what fdr does is he makes his formal cabinet members work with his informal cabinet that the senate never gave its approval to and when you look at these gentlemen uh, Ray Moley and Rex Tugwell in particular, uh, they could, there could be an argument that they were much more radical. Uh, for instance, some of these members of his informal brain trust had gone upon the USS President Roosevelt ship to Europe uh, during the late 1920s, and early 30s in the, in the midst of the depression, okay? And a lot of them had been trained under progressive uh, professors in the big universities, like Felix Frankfurter, uh, who was really big at Harvard um, and trying to, um, uh, to espouse and, and influence his students on progressive issues, right? Helping out the poor, uh, getting more government intervention on behalf of the underdogs, etc. So they not only had a more progressive and kind of radical uh, education, but when they went to Europe, uh, they went to, uh, to check out the five-year plan under uh, Joseph Stalin, uh, where he collectivized agriculture and made uh, the, the poor farmers uh, unite their lands and live in these cooperative farms uh, where they, um, the government directed how much they would farm, what they would farm. They were equally allocated uh, um, salaries according to the size of their families and need. And so, right, there, that clearly was, was a form of Marxism, right? Because they'd already had their Marxist revolution in 1917. So that was seen as, you know, uh, anathema, as, as awful, as blasphemy to hardcore laissez-faire capitalist Americans. They went and observed Stalin's Russia. They went and observed uh, Mussolini's Italy, as well as Adolf Hitler's Germany. And they saw the government heavily intervene itself into the economy, directly employ millions of young American boys to do public works and so forth. So now they're directly given a job, not by private contractor companies, but by the government itself and building a war machine, etc. So this was seen as scary, right, to a lot of mainstream Americans. But this, this group along the USS President Roosevelt of intellectuals uh, they not only went to these countries and wrote things down, but they came back with conclusions that there is a lot to learn from these experiments, right? Uh, that we, we perhaps should tamper with as far as new policies to help us get out of the depression. So you could imagine 
you know, how that is going to ruffle feathers amongst conservative Americans. How dare, dare they write something well of Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler's fascist countries and, and the Soviet Union, a communist regime. And so that's probably one of the reasons why FDR did not bother to try to nominate them as his official cabinet members, probably knowing full well that the Senate would be up in arms and saying, look at this new radical president. He's trying to put in these radicals into the cabinet. So we did it kind of behind the scenes and made them work along with and cooperate with the official cabinet members. So that's seen by some as evidence of him being a little bit sneaky and that him trying to bring about radical ideas into this new administration. And then also, right, um, in chapter 26, <clears throat> in FDR's second fireside chat, all right, especially in defense of the National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, which had just been passed by Congress. Because remember, his Congress had become democratic in both branches so of his own party. So now, right, he doesn't have to worry extensively about uh, partisan opposition by Republicans because his party is running both houses of the legislator as well. So at any rate, when it passes the National Industrial Recovery Act, he gives a speech whereby it sounds a little bit radical, where he says, you know what, that invisible hand of the market, he says, uh, take a look around the country. Uh, and, and this old political dogma here in the US of just expecting cycles to, um, to happen and for depressions and recessions to occur, and then to just wait out the storm and let the economy itself work itself out. He says, well, look around. He says that that has become uh, morally bankrupt uh, as a philosophy. And he says, and look who you overwhelmingly elected, me rather than Herbert Hoover again. And Herbert Hoover is the one that was, was more laissez-faire in his rhetoric and saying things will work themselves out. And he says, look how much you overwhelmingly elected me when I had given a famous speech where I said, we need to engage in more government experimentation and bold involvement in the economy. So he says, clearly, uh, he said, I believe the majority of American people are with me, that desperate times call for desperate measures. And this belief in the invisible hand of the market doing it its job is no longer viable and we don't believe. He likened it to a magician and saying there's no secret invisible magician that's solving our problems during this depression. So he says now, right, the government needs to get more involved uh, directly and enforce cooperation rather than uh, mere competition. And remember that sounded rather Marxist, right? With the writings of Karl Marx uh, against cutthroat competition, but getting comrades of multiple classes under government supervision to cooperate with one another. That was part of the utopian beliefs of the Marxist uh, systems. And so this sounded rather radical in his second um, speech, fireside chat over the radio to the common people. And then, like I said, he, he espouses a, a new advancement in what he felt was the role of government. Because before, right, the government had basically said that the in American political tradition, the government ought to allow equality of opportunity, everyone to be able to start a business, to be able to try to make it into a school, right? And to pursue his or her dreams of the of socioeconomic ascension moving up. But the government ought to do just that, lay the framework for it and let the system do itself. And in the name of good old rugged individualism, let people rise or fall according to their own merit hard work, talent, and good luck or bad luck. Now, right, he's saying, no, the government needs to do more than that. It needs to ensure a decent standard of living for the average American. It needs to ensure that people are free from economic anxiety and insecurity, especially those who are willing and able and even engaging in work, that there's no excuse uh, for people working their bottoms off and receiving sub- minimal standards of living, right? So this is a definitely a philosophical change, uh, enriching and enlarging the scope of our federal government 
and trying to ensure now that the average American can get by economically. So that in my mind and many historians' minds represents, you know, again, kind of a paradigm change uh, amongst the Democratic Party and political tradition of America for that matter. All right, uh, any questions so far? All right, and then there is a, an historian named William Luchtenberg, and he wrote a book in which he said, you know what? He tried to, to revise that image and says, I don't buy this. I don't buy uh, this notion of FDR as an ideologue who had this clear cut radical vision of changing American government, changing the capitalist system, uh, right? In an almost utopian way for the, for the, for the forgotten man. He says, what I see is more of a typical politician. So firstly, in the beginning of his book, he looks at FDR's early speeches uh, during um, uh, his, his running his campaign for presidency in 1932. He goes before that and looks at him as the governor of New York and says, yes, he embraced some, some um, progressive platforms, uh, but progressivism was popular at that time. So he was running with what he believed the majority of New Yorkers wanted to begin with. And as a typical politician, that's key to Luchtenberg's thesis, is that the true um, intentions of FDR, he thought, were more in line with the typical, stereotypical politician. He wanted to give the people what they wanted, which of course would help him to be elected and reelected, right? And, and, and following popular causes. And, um, and for two, uh, secondly, right, is that he didn't really have a political stance, a, a dead set consistent ideology of his own that he himself didn't even know where he really stood. That at times he demonstrated that he was kind of all over the political spectrum, uh, both left and right. So when you look at the early speeches, he doesn't convey a lot of uh, what he's going to end up doing during his presidency, right? Uh, the deficit spending, uh, public works, employing millions of Americans directly from the government to give them salaries, um, engaging in hydroelectric uh, uh, production, the government rather than private industries, right? And even subsidizing and helping poor Southerners pay for that electricity. Uh, so a lot of the most radical things he did, um, he didn't give much of a hint of during his presidential election. Now, you could, of course, take the, the, the road of saying, well, he knew how radical these things were going to be uh, in, in light of American political tradition, and he didn't want to scare voters. He wanted to deliberately seem to be uh, more middle of the road, more moderate than he really was going to be once he became president. But Luchtenberg doesn't take that stance. He takes it more literally as that um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt literally didn't even know what his plan was. He didn't even have a set plan. He didn't even have a set ideology. Uh, when he came into the presidency, he was just going to, you know, under that whole uh, dictum, uh, um, you know, the opposite of if it's not broke, you know, why try to fix it? Uh, everything was broken. So why not, right? The insanity of uh, what's the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. He saw what the Republican policy of, of not intervening much in the economy, trying to let everything solve itself. He saw how poorly that had gone economically and how that had, engaged, that had brought about a huge rejection of Republicans in subsequent elections, right? That clearly that was not popular amongst the American people. And so that's what he, that's the way he goes. Uh, his MO, his modus operandi, the way he carried things out. Oftentimes what he would do, right, is he would get these more conservative um, cabinet members, even more arguably conservative business leaders who are more, right, usually in tuned and desirous of looking out for their own interest rather than those of the general country. And he would meet, ha, make them meet in a room with his radical guys, his radical informal brain trust, and tell them semi-jokingly, you guys cannot leave this room until you pan out some compromises, right? 
And then when he would hear about some of their plans of compromise as to how to solve a certain problem of the Great Depression, he would then go with those ideas to the press. Uh, he had press conferences two days a week. They said he was very charming and disarming with his, his charm and kindness and affability uh, with, with the press. And, um, and, and kind of sound off these ideas to them so that they could put these ideas in the press and then he could find out what popular reactions there were to them. And hence, if the reaction was rather scathingly, you know, critical of, of, of what that meeting had come up with, then he would oftentimes uh, a bit manipulatively throw his cabinet members under the bus and say, yeah, that's probably not a good practical decision. So-and-so of this department was talking about that, but I agree that may not be a good idea. And then if he got a favorable reaction through the press, he would end up running with that and take the glory for it. And so with Luchtenberg, this guy was a typical politician who didn't even really know where he stood on the political spectrum, but just simply wanted to do that which was popular and that which would be effective in bringing about the best results of mitigating or eradicating the problems we were facing during the Great Depression, right? And so to him, right, that's what a pragmatist is. A pragmatist doesn't adhere consistently to any type of ideology, but just simply does whatever brings about the best practical results in that given situation. Okay, so that's another interpretation. And then some have derisively called him a demagogue. Uh, remember, a demagogue is someone who um, is out for his or her own power, is uh, for accumulating more and more power for him or herself. But the person does it under the guise of being the spokesman, right? The mouthpiece of the community at large, of doing what the people are telling him or her to do. Uh, a typical guy that's accused of demagoguery in your history 101 class might be Andrew Jackson, and he's going to use somewhat of a uh, convenient term, a uh, popular mandate, like with the Trill of Tears, for instance, forcing the civilized tribes to sell their lands through eminent domain laws to the states of the Carolinas and Georgia, etc., and move to the west to Oklahoma. He says, right, there's a popular mandate. The majority of my white citizens, this is what they want. So it's my job to give them what they want. And so you have instances of FDR, right? Uh, threatening to go above Congress where uh, his fifth cousin, Teddy kind of did the same thing. He'd go to Congress and say, okay, I need you to focus on this issue, that issue and that issue. Uh, I highly recommend this solution, that solution and that solution. And if you are non-responsive, to this popular need of what the people want changed, then I'm gonna go above your head and I'm gonna communicate directly to the people and get them uh, to basically unelect you uh, when your reelection time arrives. And so those arguably are, are somewhat demagogue-like characteristics. And then not to mention uh, in his first hundred days, which became famous for how much was passed in his first administration of 32, uh, from March to uh, mid-June. He forced Congress to meet, gave them several uh, uh, issues that needed to be faced, he said, or otherwise he'd go above their heads again to the public and to the press. And many of them entailed Congress giving him more latitude, more involvement, more power as the president to combat this depression than many, if not any, presidents before him. So he literally, you know, rather, um, you know, immodestly uh, was almost demanding and asking of Congress that they give him more powers as the president than had traditionally been given to the president over the economy. The very first one, for instance, was power of the budget. Constitutionally, uh, that is left to Congress in Article One. He was asking Congress to give him those powers to make um, unilateral on his own uh, uh, decisions about the budget. That's just one of many cases of examples. And then also when Congress began passing New Deal laws that he was 
promoting or almost demanding, the Supreme Court began invalidating some of these new New Deal laws, saying under one manner or another that they were unconstitutional. He became furious and he tried to push through Congress a court packing law uh, that was a very constitutional, uh, you know, dubious nature, doubtful nature as far as how constitutional it would have been. Or by saying, if the Supreme Court justices do not retire at 70, he reserved the right to appoint an, al an alternate. And everybody knew that whatever alternates he was going to pack the court in were going to be pro-FDR and pro-New Deal. So hence trying to manipulate the Supreme Court and pack it with allies of his own uh, to, so that they would no longer oppose his New Deal legislation. And in the spirit of checks and balances, going back to Montesquieu and the Enlightenment and your History 101 with the Founding Fathers devising the Constitution, there was a reason for all the checks and balances in the Constitution to keep one branch and one individual or group of individual politicians from having too much power, okay? So for those reasons and others, uh, some depict FDR as a demagogue, okay? And then lastly, and this of course is not the only uh, an exhaustive source of historical interpretations, but these are the ones that I've come across mo most often in reading about the New Deal, is that he was secretly conservative, that he was posing as a radical, but he was secretly trying to save the capitalist system. Because when you look at Europe, right, people were going to the far right and far left and contending that the messiness of multi-parties and their parliaments uh, was not adequately uh, efficient in, in resolving the issues of the Great Depression. So they began looking to single men, right, chief executives, like El Duce, Mussolini, the leader of, of Italy, uh, the Fuhrer, the leader of, of Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, uh, Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union. And so some people believe that he was afraid that our capitalist system was going to completely fail and that we were going to resort to something much further left or right wing. And so he did everything he could uh, to save the capitalist system that although his methods seemed radical, his undergirding goal was conservative, was to save our system of having a Republican form of government and having a capitalist economic system. So hence, right, you look at evidence of him bailing the banks out right away, of him cooperating with, but also helping uh, big businesses in the major industrial industries, right? of him helping the farmers get supply and demand and prices uh, back into a healthy equilibrium. And so hence, right, uh, in helping Americans uh, refinance their mortgages and, and regain their homes and farms, that, that while it may look radical in how he did it, he was trying to save everything. So in heart, he was conservative. And of course, central to that interpretation is the fact of how rich he was, right? He was born, you know, stereotypically uh, with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was from old Hyde Park, New York wealth. And so why in the world would he want the capitalist system to go kaput, right, when he himself was in such a comfortable position within it? All right, so any questions? All right, thank you. So like again, please feel free <clears throat> at any time to interject. So his legislation, here are some of the major works uh, under the New Deal. Uh, banking reform, he declared a banking holiday and for four days shut down all the banks of the country. And he simply took us off the gold standard, printed more money and bailed out the Federal Reserve banks, okay? Um, he also instituted the FDIC, which was not initially his idea, by the way, it was that of Congress. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, this guarantees our deposits up to a certain amount. At that time, it was like up to 2,500 that you deposited in the bank was to be guaranteed now by the federal government. Because so many people lost their entire deposits when the banks crashed during the depression, right? 
Uh, not to mention the banking system was to uh, be more receptive to the Federal Trade Commission and bringing forth uh, its information to government bureaucrats to allow them to oversee how they were um, behaving uh, with people's money and in their, their, the allocation of their loans, et cetera. Then the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, FARA, that provided direct assistance. So basically the dole, like welfare checks. This helped the states out uh, at that point, which were trying to give out the dole to people, right? Because they were literally starving and there was an immediate need to give purchasing power uh, to those who were unemployed. Because you had 25% of the workforce, about 12 million people um, unemployed at this time. <clears throat> The National Industrial Recovery Act, this, uh, what it did in the spirit of cooperation, the government bureaucrats, right, like Hugh Johnson, uh, would meet with the leaders of the, the major industries, the garment industry, the steel industry, the coal industry, the, the oil industry, the automobile industry, et cetera, right? And what they would do is they'd go to these industrial leaders and say, okay, we want a proposition for you as far as the working hours that you're willing to give your workers, the wages that you're willing to give your workers, and the prices that you would like to have for your goods. And so then they would hand that proposition to the leaders of the unions, right? And the unions were almost always up to this point and hostile odds against their employers because sadly, right, it just seems historically true that when the laborers began gaining uh, the right of collective bargaining, right? The right to go to the diplomatic table and say, okay, employers or bosses, our guys want this much an hour. They want at least 30 hours work uh, a week, but no more than 40, um, you know, and they would make those, uh, those uh, demands, if you will, for the longest time, the employers behaved very greedily and arrogantly and dismissively and would not agree to the terms that the union workers made. So the unions, right, they developed a very antagonistic uh, culture where they said, you know what, if they're not going to give these rights to us, we're going to demand them. We're going to fight for them, right? So the, the same age old tactics, uh, namely the strike, right? Um, and they stepped it up in the 30s, by the way, with a sit-in strike, because for a long time, they would simply just strike and not show up. And what would the employers do? They would hire scab or alternate workers to come in and do the job in their place. Now they're sitting in in the factory itself, refusing to leave and, and precluding the opportunity of the employers to hire scab workers to do their jobs instead. And so they became antagonistic. Uh, look up groups like the Molly Magwires and the coal mining industry. Uh, they actually engaged in violence, exploding, uh, uh, dynamiting uh, their bosses, big machines uh, and, and sabotaging the productive process, uh, literally assassinating some of their foremen, their bosses at the job place. So now, right, FDR says, in the name of this national emergency, we need to all patriotically unite together because he said what's good for one group is ultimately good for everybody and it's in everyone's best interest to do this so for instance right um uh him demanding under section 7a of the wagner act that there were to be minimum wages that unions had to be recognized they had to be entitled to engage in collective bargaining with their bosses and entitled to certain minimum wages that the government could set, right? That um, that was actually in the best interest he tried to convince businesses because all it took were a few bad apples who charged almost nothing uh, to their workers. And in cutting that corner and cutting their overhead of costs, they could then put a lower price to their products and undersell the rest of the guys. And so hence he said that that was an unfair parasitical tactic that was hurting other people in the same industry, the way that they were cutting costs like that. So now there would be standards as far as um, how things are produced in a healthy, non-dangerous manner for the workers, um, uh, how much the workers were to be paid across the board. 
So no one could have an advantage, right? And cut overhead and, and do cheaper prices. And then also no uh, ga uh, price gouging amongst competitors because they would guarantee a certain high price for the products. So we tried to make it come across as a win-win situation for both the employers and the workers. And then those like Henry Ford who refused to show up uh, to these agreements to write down these industrial labor codes. Um, what they would do is when you agreed to these codes, you were given on the premises of your uh, factories and on the products themselves, a, a simple sticker with a blue eagle and a patriotic little motto on it, saying that you had done your part to help the country get out of the depression by treating your laborers fairly and but also having guaranteed right a certain high price for your goods that everybody shared and so there was a propaganda campaign made by Hugh Johnson uh, that was running this uh, stating right trying to get Americans to pledge not to buy any products that did not have a blue eagle on them so the government went out of its way to try to blackball Henry Ford for instance for refusing to come to terms with these agreements and try to get people to become convinced it was their patriotic duty to only buy products that had the Blue Eagle on them because they had agreed to certain rights for their laborers uh, and cooperated with the government and sharing uh, tactics on how things were produced, et cetera, et cetera. And as you might guess, all of this was clearly in violation of the antitrust laws because right, the antitrust law stated that um, big businesses could not cooperate and share information, share tactics, uh, get together and set prices, right? Um, so that was a big step away from that progressive uh, goal of, um, of antitrust laws. And then also according to this legislation, uh, they um, gave millions of dollars for the Public Works Administration whereby the government was going to directly give jobs, directly employ uh, what would become millions of Americans uh, to work for it. Because remember, right, that had been the notion that when there were ever uh, cases of public works, one with the exception of the Cumberland Road and a, a few exceptions, uh, it was almost always to be um, uh, run by states rather than the federal government, right, uh, in these public works campaigns. And two, they were to do it in a, an indirect way. They were to hire and give contracts to private construction companies who in turn hired whatever laborers they wanted. Now the government is directly hiring people to work directly for the government and get paid directly by the government. So this public work stuff, right, Again, when you look to the radical left and right, to the right at fascism, to the left at communism in Europe, these radical governments were doing that. They were directly, the government was directly putting to work millions of their young men in public works projects, etc. So this smacked, right, uh, of, of radicalism, this direct work relief on behalf of the federal government. And speaking of which, they, they implemented the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. And at any given time, they had about a, uh, about a quarter of a million young men between the ages of about 18 to 25 uh, uh, brought from the inner cities where they had no jobs and were on the dole uh, tr at food lines and trying to get, uh, you know, the equivalent of food stamps uh, in their states. They were to be brought to uh, particularly the, uh, the national and state parks to the West and engage in forestry work. Uh, they planted millions of trees. They paved um, walkways and bikeways uh, throughout these parks. Uh, they engaged in tactics to try to prevent forest fires and whatever it might entail with this forestry work. But what didn't look good to some people on the right, conservatives, right? Again, not only is it uh, the federal government directly employing these young men. But secondly, they relocated many of them to the West uh, by way of you know, public transportation. They also mandated that the young workers as young unmarried men primarily could not even um, uh, have all of their salary. 
uh, they were paid a dollar a day, so 30 bucks a month. Uh, they didn't need all that because they were in barracks uh, to be granted a quarter, a bed, um, uh, showering, and, and, uh, and food, three, three good meals a day. So they didn't need all that money, right, uh, in that situation. So they mandated that a portion of their salaries go back to their families, to their mothers and their siblings, et cetera, so that they would, so that they would have the purchasing power, right? Remember going back to Keynesian economics? So that the government could help give purchasing power to their families back at home, okay? And then not to mention the way it was run Initially, it was under the Secretary of Agriculture and Interior, but for various reasons, it ended up being kind of sent over to the armed forces. And they literally had uniforms they wore. They were in military-like barracks. There was revelry, uh, uh, the bugle blown at 6 a.m., and they followed a whistle and had a very regimented lifestyle, et cetera. And so again, this looked like the black shirts under Mussolini or the brown shirts under Hitler. Uh, with uniforms and all. And so you had the Civilian Conservation Corps, and then the largest, numerically largest, uh, public works program made by the federal government was the, the Works Progress Administration. Uh, you could see this even locally in Modesto, uh, in certain areas uh, etched on the sidewalks in some of the buildings. Uh, so it went down to the local levels within many of the states is again, the federal government directly employing uh, um, uh, unemployed Americans at jobs. And what's interesting, right, is firstly, the, the scope of it. At any given time, at least two and a half million people were enrolled under the WPA. So that gave a lot of jobs to a lot of people, right? And secondly, the extent to which the government went out of its way to give jobs to people of various skills, cultures, and interest groups. So for instance, they had a federal theater project, a federal art and sculpture project, a federal writers project. So people literally were, were painting murals, uh, uh, devising plays, uh, you know, and, and, and writing and getting paid by the federal government, not just public works like roads and, and buildings and bridges and hospitals and schools, et cetera, right? Then another one is the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And this one, right, the government met with the key leaders of the key industries, right? So uh, dairy with milk, um, uh, cattle and pigs and swine, um, uh, of course, wheat and corn crop and cotton. They would meet with them, right? And they would decide, these bureaucrats, as well as the leaders of the industries, the farmers and decide how much uh, production in that given commodity needed to decrease. Because remember, farmers, it's a sad irony of the depression, they literally had all this milk, all these uh, pigs and cattle uh, that they had to sell and no one had the money to buy them. So here they were slaughtering pigs, pouring out gallons of milk, right? Because they had all of it that was unsold while millions of Americans are starving. And so what they try to do is they try to, the government tried to ensure a re, uh, you know, establishment of equilibrium between supply and demand. Because remember, demand is not technically a desire for something. It's desire accompanied by the actual purchasing power to buy it. And so what they did, right, is they began, uh, making uh, decisions on, um, on the changing and the reduction of crops. Saying, okay, in this area, we got plenty of cotton. So in this given state, in this area, they need to cease developing their cotton. And so the government actually subsidized them, pay them to no longer farm for a period of time to do away with their cotton crop, uh, 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 what is it, uh, disc the land, allow the nitrogen and other, uh, you know, vitamins and other uh, neutral, uh, nutrients to replenish themselves in the soil and to simply lay fallow for a season or two and literally do no farm work. Um, and they were paid to do that, right? And then um, 
And then of course, when they asked people to switch a crop, they didn't go so far as forcing them. Remember like the NIRA uh, to get them to agree to the code and how well they paid their workers and how many hours and what prices they would adhere to. They would just ostracize them if like Henry Ford and try to blackball them, black, uh, you know, blacklist them, but they couldn't actually force, right? Because to them that was too far uh, becoming like Stalin's communist Russia, Soviet Union. So they, they were a step away from coercion, right? But they had ways of making you pay, right? Uh, refusing subsidies to you in the future, not allowing you to uh, engage in the price fixing of the farm commodities, et cetera. They have ways of punishing you. And so, uh, so technically they tried to induce you, not coerce you uh, into changing your crop, okay? And so by and large, a lot of people did so. Now a problem with the Agricultural Adjustment Act arose in which uh, the farmers now being paid, for instance, to allow their land to lay fallow for a season or two. So literally getting paid not to farm. Well, what need do they have now of sharecroppers and tenant croppers coming on their land and doing the work for them? There's no work to be done during that time period, right? And they've already been paid by the government to do such. So what they simply did is told the tenant and sharecroppers to scram. So the actual laborers, the poor farm workers who didn't own the land upon which they worked, they suffered with the Agricultural Adjustment Act because the subsidized money didn't go to them, but to their bosses who simply chased them off their farms. And when they unionized, especially in states like Arkansas, they threatened violence unless some of that subsidy money came to them and, and Franklin Roosevelt, for whatever reasons, did not support their unions and did not support their demands and kind of arguably left, left them high and dry. Then the Tennessee Valley Authority, right? This was a progressive idea, right? Is the idea of the government getting involved uh, like with gas and water socialism, right? Where the government uh, progressives decided that certain commodities ought not to be held freely in the capitalist system on, uh, on merit, right? On what you deserve or earn. So hence, right, if you can't afford a fancy car, then you just can't buy one. You can't afford lots of land, then you just can't buy it. Uh, but they decided that certain things like access to healthcare, access to water and electricity, access to public transportation, and arguably access to a, a college education ought to be subsidized. The government ought to use tax revenue uh, to help fund and help every American uh, become entitled to those commodities and services as their right, rather than simply as a privilege. So in the spirit of gas and water socialism, right, uh, there were some scandals going on in the Tennessee Valley of Alabama at a place called the Muscle Shoals Dam, which was a huge dam and they were gonna use it to produce hydroelectric power, right? Well, there was a guy named Insole and he had a big fiasco where he went to court for white collar crimes. Then Henry Ford, who has become hated at that time, uh, offered to buy that dam and use it for his own selfish reasons and company. Uh, and so FDR said, no, uh, the government is gonna keep hold of this place. And we, the government, are going to um, uh, dam the rivers, help uh, reclamation and saving and, and irrigating uh, pivotal lands. And we are gonna produce hydroelectric power and we are going to provide it to the poor white Southerners and black Southerners for that matter, actually, down in the deep South in Alabama, we're gonna provide it for them in subsidized fashion, right? And he even tempered with subsidized housing as well which Lyndon B. Johnson will run with in the 60s. The idea where the government sees how much your family could afford to pay and the government accepts whatever you could afford and the government foots the rest of the bill of the price of that electrical power. And so that's flirting with gas and water socialism, right? Seem to be rather argued, arguably uh, radical. Then the Securities and Exchange Commission tried to reinforce confidence in the stock market right? Just like the FDIC um, 
uh, tried to inf influence people, give them confidence to put their deposits back in the banks because those deposits would be guaranteed, right? And the former act of confidence, FDR wanted people to begin to buy stocks uh, again in, in, in Wall Street. And so now he in instituted a police force, if you will, known as the Securities and Exchange Commission. And they were to regularly get paperwork uh, from um, the, um, you know, the Merrill Lynch's and so forth, right? Uh, the groups of brokers, the middlemen who would take people's investments and make their own unilateral decisions on how to uh, invest them, et cetera, right? And what stock um, purchases and decisions uh, they would make on behalf of, of, of the person buying the stock. And under old English common law, there was a Latin term that meant buyer beware, right? That's sorry, when it's a risk in, in Wall Street, right? That when you give your money to a, a broker who's supposed to know much more about the economy and, and, and Wall Street and the stock market than you do, uh, you have to just trust, you have to beware that he or she may make foolish decisions, that that person is not all knowing and, and certainly can't know uh, all the vagaries uh, of that market. But now uh, there, there is a better enforcement mechanism whereby they, the government ha becomes privy to information as far as how many stocks are being bought, how many sales in the product of that company that you're buying stocks under and what their actual profits are and aren't, uh, changes in its overhead payments, et cetera. They are to look and they are to ensure that the brokers are being honest and transparent with those who are trying to buy stocks in that company, right? So that they're less likely to feel tricked or lied to. So that's supposed to install greater confidence in, in the stock market for the average purchaser and investor. All right. Yes. So I'm sorry, I, I um, didn't get to class for, I was a little bit late. So I don't know if you covered this or not, but you were talking about um, them um, subsidizing the South. What, why was it so much emphasis on subsidizing the South? What was it, were they just having a harder time there? I mean, it was the depression. So I know, you know, America was having a hard time. But yeah. what was it about the South, why they were giving them money and helping them out? Okay, good. The, the answer I've read, Aaron, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not that intellectually satisfying, uh, but it was a progressive notion, right? And I remember uh, with his Harvard education under professors like Frank F Felix Frankfurter and others, uh, he had been educated in this progressive background, right? As well as claim to be a progressive governor of New York, it was a progressive assumption that that the economy is only as strong as its weakest links, right? Because okay. they were for a better allocation of the wealth, better allocation of opportunities, more equitably spread to all areas and all demographics. Well, okay. it was commonly asserted at that time that the South and the Appalachian areas, right, were the most backward were the most underdeveloped and economically backward and poverty stricken and marginalized of the entire country. And so hence that that's part of the explanation I've read is that he felt like who better to help than the most marginalized, the poor Southerners. He okay. also agreed though with a more traditional assumption is that when you provide uh, uh, electrical power he said it, it tended to have a positive domino effect on more businesses wanting to get involved in that area and develop businesses and develop industries, right, okay. where, where that power uh, erupts. And so he also claimed in some of his quotes that it was going to bring industry down into the South okay. and help give provide more jobs to the Southern people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And, and I then know the, the more, Appalachian area has typically been poor. Yes. Anyways. Yes. Uh, when you look at infrastructure, right, just, just transportation, communication, uh, uh, the existence or lack thereof of, of, of key pivotal industries, uh, employment statistics, 
by a lot of the indicators of the health of an economy, uh, the Appalachian statistics on the Appalachians tend to be rather um, dismal, at least up to the 1930s. Okay. All right, yeah. thank you. No problem. And then just one more anecdote that, that I'd like to share, right? Is remember, uh, court history of FDR, it's highly tied to his polio and to his marriage with his wife, Eleanor, okay? Um, uh, just before he ran for president, while he was, um, I don't know if it was while he was governor of New York or just prior to it, shame on me. I know he was in his late 30s. He, in, in later life, contracted polio, and he was known to be a very um, uh, physically active man, right? Uh, loved to swim, loved to uh, uh, engage in crew on the, on the boats uh, and, and, and go out and do physical things. He suddenly contracts polio, and it leaves him into a paraplegic who will never walk again, who's in a wheelchair the entire duration of his presidency. And the press, by the way, did a great job of hiding that. Um, so at any rate, when he went down to Warm Springs, Georgia, uh, because the idea was right is that at that time in science is they believe that the, the hot springs of the geyser water uh, uh, had great effects on, on at least uh, uh, mitigating the symptoms, if, if not outright really helping to improve polio victims. So he goes down to Warm Springs and there is a summer camp of children. And supposedly it, it had a big effect on him. Uh, you have pictures of it, et cetera. Uh, lots of poor kids with polio uh, received treatment at this Warm Springs uh, uh, you know, place, resort. But at the end of summer, they had to leave because it was no longer free. The camp was over and it was a ritzy, expensive place. So he decided, he spoke with Eleanor and decided that he was going to buy about three different resorts in that area and he was going to open it up for free to all the kids uh, to come and get free treatment. And so the argument is, is that he gained a lot of character as a man who was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and didn't really know much of adversity growing up and having a privileged lifestyle, that, that, he, um, that he developed strength of character and empathy uh, in, in fighting against polio, because for a while they were worried he was going to take his own life. And then he had a key moment where he came, had breakfast with Eleanor and said he's going to stick it through and he's going to have a more um, a positive outlook from there on after. Um, and then also, like I said, uh, according to Eleanor herself, it really moved him almost to tears seeing these kids and how many that were suffering from polio and couldn't afford those services. And so supposedly for the longest time, it gave him a heart, um, uh, not only for children, not only for the suffering of the common people, but in particular for Southerners, uh, as, as a New Yorker himself uh, felt as if, you know, uh, you have elements of, as well as with his fifth cousin, Teddy, as well earlier in your US history with Thomas Jefferson, of almost a little bit of evidence of, of wealth guilt by FDR, right? Where he's almost trying to compensate as being this paternalistic patriarch over the country who feels pity for the common poor Americans because he was anything but that uh, growing up and into early adulthood. And then not to mention, on the one hand, his relationship with Eleanor was rather uh, you might make this, the, the term subjectively uh, unhealthy, uh, that, that they're, the romantic facet to it uh, for years and years, especially after he became president and sick uh, and in a wheelchair, uh, they almost never spend a night together, especially in the same bed. She was always going on campaigns for different causes. Uh, she had such a good female friend that people were making accusations about them being lovers. Uh, he clearly had an affair with his secretary and, and no longer even tried to hide it. Uh, and so there was, a, there was a degree to which um, it was almost a political, ambitious decision by both of them that, that he wasn't going to be faithful to her. They weren't going to be very romantically intimate, but they were going to remain partners, political partners as spouses uh, during his presidency. But there's also the contention that he had this almost maternal um, image of her 
where she'd almost become his mother and, and, and it would take care of him and so forth. But also they said that almost no one had the ability like Eleanor uh, to elicit depth out of FDR because that's another common um, uh, criticism in great man history of F. Franklin Roosevelt is that people felt like he was a great actor that no one really truly knew the real him because it was always this ebullient, buoyant facade and that smile and that charm. But he really hid his true secret cards very well and that he may not have had a whole lot of depth to him as a private individual. But they said with, uh, and this is arguable, but Eleanor Roosevelt had a way of reprimanding him and shaming him and convincing him, right? that he had become president almost religiously uh, for a reason, that he was destined to be put into that position so that he could help the poor suffering people of his generation uh, undergoing this horrific depression. And so it, it's fascinating, all the different historical interpretations of Franklin Roosevelt that go from praising him to vilifying him, uh, et cetera. That's interesting. It is. I, I uh, like him, dislike him, agreement or disagreement with his policies, whatever you think he, wherever you think he really stood on the political spectrum or somewhere nowhere on it, like a typical pragmatist like Luxembourg states. Uh, I, I feel like he's just, at least you could say he is anything but boring. His administration is anything but boring. Well, so, uh, when, I, when I logged on to class, I yes. tell my mom, I, I said, I, I'm like, I've totally forgot about class. I was working on stuff for my art class. And I said, I, this is so stupid, but I'm like, the only thing I know about Roosevelt is what I have seen in that movie, Annie. And that's so, she's like, that is lame. She's like, you need to get into class and listen. <laughs> she's like, you need to pay attention. She's like, that is the most ridiculous thing you've ever said. I'm like, that is stupid Colleen or Aaron. I, I go by Colleen at home, but um, she's like, I can't believe that you would say that. She's like, you need to start listening to your teacher. She's like, that <laughs> is ridiculous. <laughs> well, I'm embarrassed to say that I have not seen that movie since <laughs> early childhood and I can't even recall. And now you have piqued my curiosity uh, I just to see how he's movie. conveyed in that movie. <laughs> hey, the sun will come out tomorrow right <laughs> <laughs> it's so dumb and she's like you're ridiculous she's like you need to pay attention <laughs> i'll be darned but no i mean honestly i i i like i said i i can't wait to look into that because i don't even remotely recall the depiction of him in that movie much less that movie i know i watched it once as a child but um but like i said a, a lot of people said that he was um he was very well equipped at, at dealing with people. Uh, he had a way, right, of not many presidents have done that, of getting these kind of, you know, radical, liberal, intellectual progressives, right, like Moley and Rex Tugwell, um, and getting them with these much more uh, conservative official uh, businessmen and uh, farm leaders and, and, and his official cabinet members, seeing them argue and just absolutely just chuckling, never getting flustered, and just being able to charismatically tell them, nope, we're going to continue arguing until we come to some kind of synthesis together, uh, that he had an, just a, an incredible way uh, of, of, um, of being just so suave and, and getting people from different backgrounds to work and cooperate with one another and to come up with some type of synthesis between left and right, uh, et cetera, between different factions that had clearly their own agendas. And, and being able to get all of this passed, right? And uh, he just, he, he definitely was um, in many ways in the in somewhat negative, but caricature of a politician, he was very much a typical successful politician, I think you would say. So, and then it, it, um, in addition to that, right, uh, the FHA and the Limke Act, uh, what he did is he demanded uh, that by subsidizing and healthy, helping out the banks, that they give a second opportunity to those who had lost their mortgages and had lost their farms 
to try to refinance and gain them back. And in some stats that I've read, as many as two out of five regain their homes and farms, which is pretty impressive. And so uh, again, right, uh, you would be hard pressed to look at a previous president, especially not during wartime, right? Uh, who did so much as far as involvement, direct involvement in the economy. And so people will say that liberalism would never be the same after this, as far as big government and an and, and large scope of, of a notion that government's responsibility is not just to protect our natural rights, but to ensure that there is a relative equal dispersion of the wealth produced by all the laborers and that there is a basic possibility for a, a basic standard of living for all uh, uh, Americans, especially those able and willing to work. All right. And then, of course, the Social Security Act, right? Uh, that doesn't seem very radical now, but it was. Uh, you look at Robert Townsend and some of the major advocates for Social Security pensions, and they were almost invariably on the far left. They were socialists uh, and other uh, people tied to Marxist beliefs. And he grabbed that. He grabbed and ran with that idea, uh, the idea, right, that, that the present generation of workers uh, pay taxes so that they could provide pensions to those who have retired, as well as those who are handicapped. And so we have that to this day as well. So my goodness, right, you look at all this and, you know, direct jobs for millions of people from the government, uh, the government bailing out bankers, but with stipulations that deposits be guaranteed, that the um, banks can no longer engage in, um, in speculation and uh, using our deposit money uh, to gamble in the stock market, right? And other types of things as such, granting second mortgage opportunities uh, to uh, uh, farmers and homeowners. Um, you know, the, uh, the getting, uh, you know, according to H.W. Uh, Brands, he was most impressed with number three, the, the National Industrial Recovery Act. You know, uh, somewhat, like I said, I think it's a step away from coercion, uh, but, but highly putting pressure upon the leaders of the major industries to agree uh, on uh, common tactics of even in the playing field of how their uh, product is produced. So hence how much overhead they're gonna to have to pay on what salaries and what working hours and conditions they're gonna promise their workers by way of the Wagner Act and, and section 7A. Um, uh, you know, it's it just, yeah, I think uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, uh, paying farmers not to farm or to change their crops and putting pressure on those who were non-compliant. Uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, the government directly engaging in hydroelectric production and, and, and subsidizing that to poor farmers. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive when you see the, the swath of, of things that were done to combat the, the depression. And I think that, you know, it, it's important to remember when you go back up to these four interpretations that, you know, it's not either or. There could be a little bit of truth to all of this, right? There was a degree to which I think that you can't deny in his second um, uh, fireside chat to the American people and saying he no longer believed in the invisible hand and that the government ought to enforce cooperation and not competition and that, um, that uh, the government's role uh, should, should add in scope in providing the maintenance of a basic standard of living for the average American. That was a big break. Uh, from traditional American political tradition. Uh, uh, before that, you can make the argument in both parties, it was much more laissez-faire. It was much more government. That's not government's role to get involved that highly. Uh, his use of those, quote, radicals like Tugwell and Moley as, as indirect or informal cabinet members that were uh, kind of secretly behind the scenes and helping with these uh, uh, these uh, programs, his uh, willingness to engage in deficit spending uh, to, to ensure uh, purchasing power and jobs 
for the common people directly and not through private business. I think all those need to be remembered and in, in as far as seeing a more kind of idealistic and, and, and uh, revolutionary side to FDR. But do you, um, uh, do you have, um, you know, evidence of him acting like a mere pragmatist of not always knowing, especially at the beginning, uh, what he was going to do uh, early in, in, in his administration, him deferring to his brain trust and telling him, I don't know what to do, guys. You guys get together, come up with ideas and then run them by me. Um, you know, uh, him first going to the press and kind of fill things out. What do the Americans think about this idea? And if they didn't like it, he would kind of scrap it. If they did, he would run with it. So maybe there is a side to which he was kind of a pragmatist. Was there a demagogue side to him running four times for president, uh, asking, almost demanding Congress uh, to give him a lot of latitude to make decisions in key industries? Uh, was there a demagogue-like side to him as well? And then also, ultimately, what did he do, although he fundamentally altered our capitalist system, right? In the end, right, we still have a capitalist system. And so in the end, was there a conservative side to him as well, whereby he ultimately did not want to go the way of fascism or Marxism, but wanted to, uh, to uphold and, and, and um, you know, rescue our capitalist system. So I think that you can't forget that either, that there could be elements of truth to all four of these depictions of him and his New Deal. So are there any concluding questions or comments? Pretty fascinating guy, huh? He's really interesting. Yeah, I subjectively think so. He's yeah. definitely one of my favorite presidents to, um, uh, to read. I find him so interesting. Yeah, to go by just three letters or like initials and everyone knows who he is. He had to be a good, a good. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. Like, you know what I'm saying? No, absolutely. I think outside the realm of, you know, uh, history buffs, I, I think FDR absolutely is one of the most uh, widely known uh, presidents we've had. I have something to tell you real quick. It's a little off topic, though. It's okay. That's okay. It was just from last, like, your History 101. And you were talking about the, I don't know how you say it, the Castillo San Marcos in St. Augustine. And the Spanish, uh, you spoke of them in our history class. Uh-huh. It's a star fort, like. Do you, do you know much about the star forts? Oh, gosh, I don't. I'm so well, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, I, I, I just I know it to... was connected to Fort de Mose, and de yes. Mose was a haven for runaway slaves. Yes, yes. uh-huh. Who were willing and... to convert to the Catholic faith, and mm -hmm. in return, uh, the Spanish would promise them protected refuge uh, from Georgia and some of the extreme yes. Anglo-American uh, slave-owning communities. Exactly. Um, it also is, is oftentimes tied to the history of Caribbean piracy, um, uh, yes. especially uh, getting the, 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 the bullion uh, from the Americas and that being a way station there um, on their way back to Europe. And so uh, pirates would oftentimes, uh, it was a highly coveted and attacked and, and visible uh, area of the Spanish American empire. And so, yeah, yeah I, I apologize. A, I haven't read much no, as far okay. as a book centered on Spanish Florida. I just wanted to tell you that my boyfriend was fascinated with these star forts one night after watching Game of Thrones and he's showing, look at this one, look at this one. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have been there. So I went to St. Augustine and I have walked in that fort. Um, the, it's just right on the edge, on the water's edge in St. Augustine. It's so incredibly Beautiful. It's just a neat part of history. It's probably the only history I've ever seen. <laughs> no, but. good for you. And and uh, it's also tied to um, uh, to their fight against Protestant French Huguenot that came into that area. And um, so Florida was highly contested. The Augustinian monks that did missions, they, they encountered a lot of um, opposition from the Tallahassee and other tribes. Uh, Florida was very contested. I would say it's second only uh, to New Mexico 
as a, a conflict ridden uh, Spanish colony here in the US. Uh, so a lot of drama and conflict to read about. You kind of uh, went but, over it real quickly at the beginning of History 101. And I was, that's in the beginning when I was like, oh my God, what's he talking about? Like it was just so foreign to me. And lo and behold, I had been there. So I just thought it was magnificent. It's, they're really interesting if anyone wants to look at them. This piece no, good for you. And as you guys may know, a little FYI, is St. Augustine, Florida is the longest lasting uh, permanent uh, Euro American city in this country. Yeah, I just read that. It's the oldest in the oldest city in the nation, they said. That's exactly. right. Yeah. Hmm. A little off topic, but I thought it was cool today when I figured that out. <laughs> no, that's no problem. Uh, it is. It's fascinating. I apologize. I haven't read more on that particular subject. Um, but no, no problem. Don't don't be afraid to to make any comments like that. It's not that off topic. It's history. It's U.S. history. Um, uh, anybody else before we call it quits today? No, I don't think so. All right. Well, thank you guys. I enjoy this class. I always do uh, and your input. So I will, uh, I will post this uh, as soon as I can and good luck with this. Okay. We're, we're almost done. You guys uh, hang in there uh, and I'm proud of you. And uh, if you have any questions, Canvas message me. Okay. Thank you. It was a really interesting um, topic today. Thank you. I think so too. This is a great Will topic. Do. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good day. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.